Hey everybody, this is Nestor Diaz from the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, and this is PGC MLS This Week. On Monday at 7 p.m., we'll be having a film discussion on Through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People. This film is the first documentary to explore the role of photography in shaping the identity, aspirations, and social emergence of African Americans from slavery to present. It probes the recesses of American history through images that have been suppressed, forgotten, or lost. You are able to watch this film for free with your library card through Canopy by visiting pgcmls.info slash digital dash suite. We will be joined by the film's director, Thomas Allen Harris, and professional photographer and educator, Bill Gaskins, for this special discussion. Tuesday at 3 p.m., visit the Spalding's Branch Library for an outdoor afternoon of mass decorating and a discussion about the history of Mardi Gras. Why not bring the whole family? Author Jason Steinhauer joins us Wednesday at 7 p.m. to discuss his book, History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. The internet has inundated the public sphere with historical information and misinformation, changing what we know about our history and history as a discipline. It has changed the past. Steinhauer's History Disrupted chronicles how and why it matters. On Thursday at 10.30 a.m., you and your little ones have two options for fun, outdoor, ready-to-read story times. Register for either the Baden Branch or New Carrollton Branch Library story times by visiting pgcmls.info slash events. On Friday at 4 p.m., kids can celebrate Women's History Month by learning about three women who have each contributed to our understanding of how diseases spread and how you can stay healthy. Then participate in a virtual STEM activity for kids of all ages and their families during STEM at Home, Women in Health Sciences. Be sure to check out our Black and Proud Plus art exhibit opening this week at the Oxen Hill Branch Library. It celebrates the vibrancy of Black queer culture in this community from poetry to portraiture. Thanks for watching. And did you know that PGCMLS is on TikTok? You should check it out to see all the fun stuff our staff are up to. That's it for this week. But until the next time, have a good one. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System and Office of Human Rights virtual author and speaker event series. My name is Nick. Uh, I am joined by wonderful friends and guests, Kyla Hannington and Jason Steinhauer tonight. Um, I am the COO for communication and outreach at the library, and Kyla is the uh, wonderful person who has a really long new title that's over all things public engagement and outreach, and she's the manager of that that area of work at the Office of Human Rights. I apologize, if Kyla. I should have better with that, but I love you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jason is the author of History Disrupted, as well as a public historian and a wonderful friend and colleague uh, who I got to know when we both worked at the Library of Congress years back. Um, before we get started with our conversation, I just want to remind you of a couple things. Uh, you should borrow or purchase Jason's book. That is the best way to support work and authors who you believe in. Uh, we have, believe it or not, almost 100 copies of the ebook available right now on temporary access since we have the event. So. Visit the library. Um, authors get compensated through library copies of ebooks and and print books. So check that out. Um, and very briefly, I'm going to give you a quick intro to Jason's background. Uh, he's passionate about creating an educated, informed, and historically and media literate citizenry. He served as the founding director of the Lepage Center for History and the Public Interest, and is currently a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, in addition to being a contributor to Time and CNN. He's a past editorial board member of the Washington Post Made by History section and a presidential counselor of the National World War II Museum, which I got to recently visit for the first time. If you've never been there, it's a must-see, um, top-rated uh, site to see in New Orleans, believe it or not, which is really cool too. Uh, and he worked for seven years at the U.S. Library of Congress. Uh, in 2020, founded History Club on Clubhouse, which has many, many, many thousands of members, over 100,000 members, and averages 2,500 participants per week. And in 2021, he founded the first cryptocurrency devoted to history, which is pretty awesome. Uh, dollar sign, all caps, JSON, space coin, which is pretty cool. Um, and that helps fund public facing history projects. Uh, in 2014, he coined the term history communicators and has worked with colleagues around the world to found the new field of history communication. Uh, he's also the founder and CEO of the History Communication Institute, and we are here to discuss his first book, but more broadly, the topics that he has been championing uh, in a way that invites people from all kinds of interest groups and disciplines to think about what it means for history to be communicated. And boy, is this work relevant to our daily lives right now and our lives of the past three years, as well as always, but it's certainly been uh, much more in focus. So welcome, Jason. Welcome, Kyla. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. As you know, I'm a big fan of libraries. 
I worked at the Library of Congress for seven years. I worked at the New York Public Library before that. And in fact, the very first line of this book acknowledges the two libraries that were critical to the research for the book, the Falvey Memorial Library and the Library of Congress. So um, yay library and anything I can do to support what you guys are doing. Awesome. Well, um, so just for format for everyone, we're gonna have a discussion with Jason for a little bit. Uh, feel free to share your questions and comments in the chat as we go. We would love to uh, see that coming in. Also let us know where you're tuning in from. I know we have our, our posse from uh, Hawaii here, as well as uh, our number one fan from Oxen Hill, Miss Vivian, and some others who are tuning in. So uh, thank you for joining us. The other thing you can do is if you are watching on social media, which all of you are, even if you don't realize it, um, please share the link so that we can reach some more folks. And also this program will be available on demand after the fact. So there's a lot to talk about here, but before we get into kind of the, the, there's a lot of meaty provocative questions I have, and I'm sure Kyla has a lot of them too, but can you introduce to us the uh, term history, uh, e-history and also history communication so that we can kind of all start this conversation from a, a <coughs> playing field? All right. So to answer these questions, I have to get into the origins of the book, which is a great place to start, right? Oh, we start at the beginning. So as you noted, uh, I worked at the Library of Congress for seven years. While I was at the Library of Congress, I worked in something called the John W. Kluge Center, which was the scholar center inside the Library of Congress. And that's the Kluge Center brings scholars from around the world to the library to conduct research in the library's collections. So one of the scholars that we had in residence at the time I worked there was a chair in astrobiology. And the gentleman who held that position was David Grinspoon. And David Grinspoon was a planetary scientist, is a planetary scientist. And he also describes himself as a science communicator. So he introduced me to this world of science communication. And science communication, in a nutshell, there's a lot of different variations on what people think science communication is. But in a nutshell, it's a subdiscipline of science which seeks to analyze how scientific information gets communicated through various media and what the effect is on public understanding of science, and also to think about how scientific information can best affect public policy. So the more I learned about science communication, the more I said to myself, history should do the same. There should be something called history communication, and we should train people to be history communicators. We should analyze and think critically about how historical information gets communicated through traditional media and social media and analyze that and interpret it so that we can better affect public policy and public conversation. So I suggested to my colleagues in the history profession that we should do this. There was some enthusiasm. There was also some skepticism. So uh, a bunch of us got together in 2016 to actually create a history communication curriculum. Courses in history communication have now been taught at several universities. There's actually a history communication lab at Wayne State University in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And um, there have been history communication fellowships. And as you noted, myself and some colleagues are setting up something called the History Communication Institute. But in the process of doing all that, I began to realize that there was actually a bigger story here and that this was the potential for a book to really analyze how the web and social media have affected not only how we communicate history, but actually changed what we know about history and what, how we think about history. And so I began doing research and I took some notes and I did some writing and then I put it down. I changed jobs. I changed cities. I got married, bought a house, came back to it. And because there's been so much discourse about how social media has changed our lives, I kind of thought that someone would write this book before I got to it because people have been writing about how social media has changed politics, how it's changed public health, how it's changed journalism, but no one had written about how social media has changed history. So I wrote the first draft in 2019, second draft in 2020, third draft in 2021, and in 2022, the book has come out, and I'm pleased to say only two months in, it's already a bestseller, which is cool. But this gets to the other question you asked, which is e-history. So throughout the process of writing this book, I began to feel like the way historical information gets communicated through the web and social media is really an evolution in the way we communicate historical knowledge. And 
I was looking at all these case studies, right? History on Wikipedia, history on Twitter, historical information you see on Instagram, even historical information that you encounter on Clubhouse. And the more I thought about it, the more I felt like there was actually, there actually needed to be a common term for all of this stuff, right? It needed some sort of overarching definition. It needed some sort of unifying concept in order to make sense of it and also to write about it. And in the same way that we have books and eBooks, in the same, book, same way we have commerce and e-commerce, I thought that a good name for this would be e-history. We have history and we have e-history. And to me, as I talked about in the book, the e-history that we encounter online actually tends to share some common characteristics, which at first glance are not obvious, but the more I looked into it, the more it started to sort of surface to me. And so we can talk about what that is and why it matters and how it affects our understanding of the past and all that stuff. But essentially, e-history is the, the name that I have given to all of these different digital encounters of history communication, whether it be from Wikipedia all the way to information generated by artificial intelligence. And there is actually a definition of e-history in the book, and it's on the very first page of chapter one. Awesome. Um, Kyla, feel free to jump in if you if you got a good segue for that. Otherwise, I've got plenty that I can. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's a good segue, but I will jump in with, with, with this burning question that I have. And I, and I had it before, um, the, the, as I was, you know, when I first started reading this, which was before the events of the last few days, but um, on page 30, and then again on page 110, there's a theme that, that I see. And so it's, being dismissive of subject matter experts could lead to the end of democracy itself. And so, you know, this, the book kind of opens with this and then closes with this thought. And, um, and then all, but in between that, I recognize myself, frankly, and a lot of the, um, I'm like super, 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 super good at reading something for two minutes and then having like a, at least a two hour opinion about it. And so I like caught myself, but I was so struck by what, the book was saying about the impact of that kind of um, knowledge on democracy. And so can you expand on that for people who haven't had the chance to read it yet? I can certainly try. Um, so, okay. So this actually, we can pick it up from the question about e-history, right? Okay. So the more I looked into this and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this notion of e-history is actually attempting to solve a problem in a very sort of Silicon Valley type of way. Silicon Valley people always talk about solving problems. That's like how you come up with a new product or a new feature is right. What problem is it solving? And in some ways, e-history solves a problem. So what problem does e-history solve? Well, my argument in the book is that the professional discipline of history as it's been practiced since it coalesced into a profession about 150 years ago, is an expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit that relies on its intrinsic value to society and is time-consuming to produce. The social web, however, has been designed to be user-centric. It is a commercially driven data-driven enterprise, it promises to deliver instantly gratifying results and is extrinsically valuable. In other words, the value of something on the web only comes from how well it can be tracked or measured in metrics or how many clicks and views and shares it gets or how much it helps you do something else like sell a product or make a transaction, right? So you have this professional discipline of history, which is expert-centric, always evolving, intrinsically valuable, and um, I always forget the four of them, even though I wrote it in this book. <laughs> it's like, I should probably just write this down. But anyway, you have this intellectually always evolving, user expert-centric, intrinsically valuable, time-consuming thing, which you're trying to transpose into this user-centric commercial enterprise, which promises instantly gratifying results and which relies on extrinsic measures of valuation. And so 
E-history to me is the way that you bridge that gap. It's the way that you take something that is expert centric and turn it something that is user centric. It's the way that you take something which is time consuming to produce and make it instantly gratifying. And so what I argue in the book is that actually over time, if you look at this, the information about the past that you tend to see online is information that tends to be user-centric, commercially viable, extrinsically valuable, and instantly gratifying, and not the, co the, the content that is expert-centric, that is time-consuming to produce, that is intrinsically valuable, and that is an intellectual, always evolving pursuit. So I argue in the book that this clash of values actually is at the heart of understanding what is happening to history on the web, because over time, I argue that the web is actually changing our definition of history to be in conformity with the conditions of the social web and less in conditions with the professional discipline of history. Okay, so how does this get to your question? And I know this is very complicated, but if you read the book, I promise it'll make sense. Um, <clears throat> there's a certain assumption among some that in order for democracy to thrive, it must be expert centric. And in fact, this has been an argument that has been repeated over the past 10 to 15 years by experts, whether they be scientific experts, foreign policy experts, historical experts. And I cite several of these arguments in my book. The rhetoric has been that without expertise, without expert knowledge on things like foreign affairs or history or science, democracy falters. And there have been plenty of examples that people have used, whether it be the election of Trump or whether it be Brexit or whether it be COVID, right? So the question is, if we accept that argument to be true, and there are some people who don't, but if we accept that argument to be true, then how do we square that with a social web which has purposefully been designed to be user-centric as opposed to expert-centric? That purposefully in its designs and in its algorithms does not privilege expert knowledge over non-expert knowledge, where all knowledge is sort of created equally and has the possibility to be disseminated and distributed equally, regardless of the credentials attached to the person creating it. And that is, I think, one of the great puzzles that we have been trying to sort out as a society over the past 15 to 20 years, right? We want to have a democratic public sphere where people can participate. And in fact, some of these expert gatekeeping mechanisms that have been put in place have excluded certain people, right? And overwhelmingly people of color. So seems like there's a positive aspect to democratizing the public sphere and allowing more people to speak. But how do we balance that with understanding that there are certain moments and times where we'll, we, we will need expertise and yet we operate in a social media ecosystem that doesn't privilege it. One of the um, the big topics that is woven throughout the book is the notion of authority, and certainly library people are used to that because you know authority with vocabulary and, and taxonomies and things like that is a big part of the back end of how we provide access through metadata. But can you explain a bit about what authority means in the context of history and public history communications and who determines who has authority? Because that's, you know, the way that that is shifting constantly, even in the moment on a platform basis is, is really one of the expressions of what you're talking about in the book. Yeah. So I think one of the better examples of this in the book is the chapter on the crowdsource past and some of the case studies around Wikipedia, right? And so Wikipedia was purposefully designed to be user-centric, not expert-centric. And I talk about this in the book. The very formation of Wikipedia had a certain anti-expertise attitude towards it. The idea that anyone could contribute and that Basically, the crowd, whether it be the crowd editing a certain entry or the crowd of Wikipedia editors or the crowd of Wikipedia contributors would be the ones to shape the entry and what it said. So in that instance, the design of the platform itself gives authority to the crowd of users who are creating the entry, and it removes authority from the subject matter expert who may be a lone author or lone voice in the crowd. 
And I talk about this in the context of one incident in particular, which happened a few years ago, where a subject matter expert who had um, researched about the Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886 tried to update the Wikipedia entry for that incident and was denied. And he had done some research in the Library of Congress to learn and reveal that something that was on this page was inaccurate, that the sort of common uh, wisdom about this incident had a factual or inaccurate aspect to it. And so he went to the Wikipedia page to try to update it. And, you know, just to put it in a parlance of your question, his authority was no good there. The crowd refused to allow him to update the entry. And then he tried again, and they refused him again, and then he tried again, and they refused him again. And the logic that the editors and contributors to that page used was that if the crowd and if the common consensus says X, but a single subject matter expert says Y, then Y should not be able to overrule X on Wikipedia because Wikipedia is meant to reflect the authority of the crowd. And they actually cited in their example that if everyone in 1888 believed that the sky was green, but one expert came around and said the sky was blue, the Wikipedia entry would read that the sky was green, not that the sky was blue. Because the authority is vested in the crowd, it's invested in the user, not in the expert. And so these platforms just in their design, right? They confer certain types of authority. And what's interesting is that you can see over time how younger generations now see certain types of knowledge and uh, platforms to be more authoritative, authoritative than others. And I talk about this in the book in that same chapter. I have talked to so many young groups, whether it be um, interns at uh, think tanks or college students. And I always ask them about these questions, like how would you determine what was authoritative? And people will cite Wikipedia or they'll say, well, we go to multiple sources online and we fact them against each other, right? It's this idea that if you sort of navigate through the crowd, you will eventually find some authoritative source of truth. No young group that I've ever asked this to has ever volunteered and voluntarily said, I would look at a book by a single author mm -hmm. who's a subject matter expert. No one has ever said that to me in like three years of asking this question. And that tells me that people's understandings of where authority reside and where authority come from have been shifted by the web and these platforms in ways that we have not fully recognized and accounted for. That was one of the things is you talk about Wikipedia. So I went to university, I started university when I was 35 years old, shout out to all of you mature students. Um, and so that was, I graduated, not to give my age away, but I graduated in 2012. And so I started in 2009. And what I remember, I had history, history um, undergraduate degree. And what we were told over and over again was that Wikipedia was not a reliable source. You could not go to Wikipedia. You could not go to Wikipedia. Like we were just told, hammered this to us over, like that's not a source. And, you know, I have children who are not that much young. Well, you know, they're, they've got one of them in the university, one has already graduated. And my sense was that for them, Wikipedia, in fact, you know, you may not be able to cite it in a paper, but it was a reasonable place to go and like um, at least get that first brush of information. And it's so contrary to what I was being told I mean, hammered over and over again 12 years ago versus I think what their experience is. And as I was reading this book, I got this impression of, of um, that, and I think you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my, my takeaway a lot of this was that, hit the, that history, how we see history is changing. And that when in the social sphere, it is basically, as you've just outlined, it's sort of a popularity contest, which is not necessarily about factualness, but it's about what is the most popular Point of view is that have i understood that uh yeah well a couple of things there first of all as i talk about in the book so contributions to wikipedia actually peaked in 2006 right and so they've been going down ever since which is interesting because wikipedia the site is now just the tip of the iceberg and talk about this at the end of the book information from wikipedia is being 
broadcast all across the web, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without us even realizing. You go to YouTube, it's pulling information from Wikipedia. You go to Google, it's pulling information from Wikipedia. Amazon Alexa is pulling information from Wikipedia. Siri is pulling information from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia itself, Wikimedia, has actually entered into an agreement, this was done very quietly, uh, with major companies in order to make sure that information from Wikipedia feeds these artificial intelligence platforms and learning platforms that they are all developing. So it's not just going to the site itself, right? This information is now through the network effects just being disseminated all around the world. And we're all getting information from Wikipedia, even if we don't realize it. And even if we are skeptical of it as a authoritative source. Mm -hmm. So these platforms have long lasting consequences, even after their peak periods of usage. And I think that's something that we underappreciate and perhaps have understudied in these things. Now, the other point you're pointing out is that, and I talk about this in the book, I talked about it just before, Wikipedia promises you instant gratification, both as a contributor and as a user. You can make edits right away, and you can also get quick answers to questions right away. So that, in some ways, is a polar opposite to how the professional discipline of history works, right? Because to publish anything in the professional discipline of history, it takes a long time. You go through peer review. People review your work. It's fact-checked. It's edited. It's revised. This book took five and a half years to produce. Wikipedia promises its users the exact opposite experience. And also the same thing uh, applies on the other end. If you are a historical researcher trying to answer a question, you have to do a lot of research. You have to look at multiple sources. You have to evaluate those sources against each other to find out what is accurate. Well, Wikipedia promises you an instant answer right away. It is instantly gratifying and it's user centric. And what's happening is that we are gravitating more and more towards these platforms and methods of learning that are user centric and instantly gratifying. And I worry and argue in the book that we are losing our desire to fund and support the opposite, things that are expert centric and things that are time consuming to produce and which challenge us to ask deeper questions and go further. And Wikipedia is the first case study in the book because I feel like in some ways it started us down this path. And other platforms that have come after it, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, or even artificial intelligence, have built on some of these assumptions that were baked into Wikipedia from the outset, including this aspect of being user-centric and this abstract aspect of sort of being instantly gratifying. One final thing I'll say, your question about popularity, I wouldn't phrase it as popularity. What I talk about in the books, I talk about different mechanisms by which information becomes visible to us online. And one of those mechanisms is crowdsourcing. So if you can crowdsource information about the past, effectively online, you can raise it to the attention of people and get people to accept it as truth. That's not necessarily a popularity contest because what it is, is manipulating the ecosystem in order to achieve a result. And that can be done for good in the case of something like Black Lives Matter, but it can be done for bad as well. And I talk about in the book, an example of far right groups in Japan who have crowdsourced their xenophobic and nationalistic views of history so well into the public sphere that it has actually become part of public discourse there. And in fact, even cited by one of the prime ministers. So crowdsourcing can have positive and negative effects. But what I want to do in this book is I want people to understand that that is one of the ways that information about history becomes visible to you online. And to your point, it has nothing to do with accuracy or veracity. It just has to do with being able to manipulate the platforms. Um, one of the, the areas that you cover in depth in the book is the way that uh, media as a business proposition has had to change because of the shift in the ecosystem and how the economics have changed for newsrooms and um, the way that content is created and such. Um, could you explain that a bit to our viewers tonight on um, how the, the media landscape has had to change because of this shift in um, society's behaviors and, and desires for um, methods for accessing information? Yeah, so one of the mechanisms I talk about in the book is something I call the newsworthy past. And so the idea is information about history in the past becomes visible 
in different ways online. And one of the ways it becomes visible online is if it can be pegged to the news cycle. And we're seeing that right now with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, right? Because ordinarily, you would never see anything in the United States. You would never see anything about Ukrainian history on the web. But all of a sudden, the last two weeks, because it's a major news story, you're now seeing information about Ukraine everywhere, including historical information. So when something becomes uh, a big news story or it gets sucked into the media frenzy or the news cycle, then media companies will use the past and leverage the past and people who speak and write about the past as a means to generate content, right? And these are, this is important because uh, to your point, the news media in this country is a business at heart, first and foremost. And so when a major story is breaking and people are showing interest and concern about that story, the media is forced to generate as much stories and coverage as it can on that topic in order to get eyeballs, get viewers, sell advertising, right? These are major opportunities for these companies. And so they seek to capitalize on it. And one of the ways they capitalize on it is by exploiting information about the past. And again, this information about the past, I argue in the book, is instantly gratifying. It seeks to give you a quick answer to a complex subject right away. And I also argue that it is user-centric because ultimately what it is trying to do is trying to give you as the reader an entry point into the past that is good enough so that you can feel like you're contributing to the story or feel like you know enough to say something about it online or feel like you know enough about it so that you can turn to your friend at the water cooler tomorrow and say, hey, did you see that story in the New York Times about Ukrainian history? They said X, Y, Z, and then you can move on to another subject, right? It doesn't actually go really deep and it's not really intended to. It's intended to be sort of good enough, instantly gratifying, user-centric, and part of this larger commercial ecosystem, which is churning out stories all the time in order to capture eyeballs, get your data, and sell advertising. Now, again, is that necessarily a terrible thing if it keeps media companies in business and people are able to do journalism? That's sort of a different question than what I'm asking in the book. My goal is to try to understand the ecosystem and answer why certain e-history becomes visible to you online and why others you will never see. And the past two weeks is a great case study because you can say to yourself, okay, I never saw Ukrainian history before online because it wasn't pegged to the news cycle. But now that there's a hot item in the news cycle, I'm seeing Ukrainian e-history everywhere. And then three or four weeks from now, when the news cycle has moved on, I probably will never see Ukrainian history again. So this is sort of like an illustration right in front of our eyes of how this all works. One uh, slight follow up, there's a bit of a, a rabbit hole tangent. Um, it's been very interesting to me as a communications person to see how President Zelensky's communications team has been recycling images from previous press conferences and the same shirt. And I, I you know, I know he's in a cr crazy situation, but um, how important is it to approach the content in the e-history sphere um, with a lens of scrutiny to know that? everything that you are seeing, especially from an official source, is being put forward in a deliberate way, for the most part, that is trying to get you to get a certain interpretation out of it. And it's, we can't look at a real-time tweet from President Zelensky right now and think that that's a real-time picture. It's just not the reality of it. Um, and, and how do we kind of approach filtering that information for ourselves? It's a great point, and it's not a tangent at all. It's directly connected to the book because one of the things I want people to take out of this book is to recognize the agendas that are at work surfacing content before your eyes. And I feel like that is a critical ingredient for media literacy and also historical literacy. And so I think that's the very first question that we all need to ask ourselves when we encounter information online, particularly information online that is connected to political actors and political leaders is what is what are the agendas behind this content and why am i seeing this now and when that relates to history it opens up all kinds of interesting questions which is such as the ones that are in my book 
Am I seeing this information now because it was crowdsourced to me by some group or organization? And if so, what is that group and organization and what is their motive and their agenda? Uh, it could be a human rights organization or it could be a disinformation campaign, but you need to know which is which before you decide how to engage with the content. Uh, the same is true with the news cycle. Uh, why am I seeing this now? Why is this information about the past all of a sudden so crucial to the news industry when it wasn't last week or the week before? Uh, I think if we can start to ask those questions about the content that we see online, it just makes us much savvier media consumers, right? And it allows us to see exactly what you're talking about, which is the agendas that are competing in our news feeds all the time for our attention and to frame events. And as I talk about in the book, the initial framing of an event is critical because that is oftentimes the framing that sticks. So when a big news story is breaking or a big seismic event is happening, you will see that there is a frenzy to frame it in a certain way. We saw it last night with the State of the Union, for, for example, because these are very smart people who have studied this stuff and they know that the first framing is oftentimes the one that sticks and that, beca that narrative becomes very hard to break once you've established it. I was thinking as I was reading this and I, you know, the recognizing of myself, as I said in the beginning about this, taking, you know, two minutes of information and then being able to expound for hours. You're welcome, everybody who's had to put up with that. And I was thinking about the, like, what are the implications? Like on a personal level, like, what does that mean for me? And I, one of the things that I was aware of in a really sort of frightening way is how much um, I, I, I do, I no longer engage in critical thinking that in fact, to some extent, I am afraid to engage in critical thinking because I don't want to ponder the other point of view, whatever that is, that I'm like, I am as much entrenched in a certain viewpoint and an opinion as really anybody else. And that I can, um, I read things that shore that up and I actively choose not to, um, to consider all sides of argument. And as a history, I'm so hopefully my, uh, history professors aren't listening to me say this because of course as a, the, that's you have to do that when you know you write a history paper you have to say some people say this some people say this i'm going to argue this i mean like that's the whole field and i think about the implication for critical thinking as we look at voting and you know our our office with the library does a whole series called voting democracy in action we think about the need for democracy and voting and how we make decisions and if we are collectively um avoiding critical thinking and I, and I guess my takeaway from your book or at least how I saw it in myself was this is kind of um the two minute read when we don't do an in-depth study we we um avoid or disallow ourselves the opportunity to do critical thinking this is a lot of words to get to a question about critical thinking <laughs> which is is this is this an outcome that you express when you were asking people these questions and you were talking to young people like what do you see about how it, the implications for critical thinking so if you read the book, uh, and you know, speaking to the audience here, if you read the book, you will see that at the end of it, I have great concerns about this e-history universe that we have all collectively created and had a hand in creating. And uh, there are a lot of concerns that I have, but uh, one of them is the way these platforms work, the filter bubbles that they create, are so subtly done that we don't even recognize when we're in them, right? And I will use myself as an example because I actually, as part of this book, audited my own Twitter account. And I will write more about this on my newsletter. So if people are not subscribed to a newsletter, please do. It's uh, jasonsteinhower.substack.com because I have a lot of stuff that didn't get in the book, including this stuff about... Uh, the Twitter timeline and how it works and a lot of other things. Uh, but anyway, I audited my own Twitter account because I was so proud of myself that I was like, you know what? All these other historians, they're stuck in these filter bubbles. They're only talking to other historians, but not me. I'm better than that. I've been really conscious and deliberate about curating my feed. And guess what? The person I was interacting the most with on my Twitter feed was my sister. And 
the other like top 10 people I was interacting with were all people who were like in my demographic, in my socioeconomic status, in my field. And like the top 10 was like, you know, a very high percentage of the tweets. And so I say this because one of the things you learn when you write a book about social media is that everyone has strong opinions about it because we all use it, but we're all seeing such a small piece of the pie. And it takes a lot of work to break out of it. Five and a half years of work, for example, in the case of this book. So to your point, one of the worries I have with e-history is that e-history becomes a tool by which we confirm our own biases and then broadcast those biases back to other people who already hold those same views. And it just becomes this big echo chamber of people broadcasting and personifying their future, their virtues to people who are just like that. And it makes sense when you think about it because that's the way the web is designed. It wants you to stay on the platform as long as possible in order to extract more data from you and to sell more advertising. And the way they get you to stay on the platforms, and this is true of all platforms, is by showing you more content and more people that you have already proven that you will engage with. And so we're seeing this in all aspects of society, but in my book, I'm particularly interested in how it's affecting what we know about history. And to your point, it offers us a user-centric, because it reflects something about us, and an instantly gratifying way to engage with historical information because it's something we can say reflects well on us, reflects well on the people that we spend time with online, and it gives us that, to your point, like two-minute jolt of emotion that we're right about something and that we're on the right side of history and our cause is just and blah, 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 and then we move on to the next thing. And so it, as I write in the book, it shows us the 5% of the universe and convinces us that we've seen the whole thing. Whereas the real good stuff is in the 95% that we're not seeing. And so breaking out of that, I think is imperative for us to develop that type of critical thinking, media literacy and historical literacy that you're referring to. Uh, we have a lot of great audience questions that we're going to jump to in a hot second. Um, I, I have one final thought that I want to put out for, for Jason's comment um, before we go there. Um, and this is more just to hear, hear what you have to say in response to it. So one of the things that I do, which is a not always healthy thing, um, when there are historical things happening or real-time crises happening, like when we worked at the library, oftentimes you could go on Twitter and if you know how to do your searching, you're gonna find out what's happening of a security event on Twitter before you hear from your employer about needing to shelter in place, before you learn that there's a suspicious package out front and that kind of thing. Um, so for me, as someone who wants information to know how to protect myself and make up my own mind over what's the best information for me, um, do you perceive that there are some benefits to the information overflow and manipulation that happens in, in terms of giving us the options and more access to raw material versus waiting for curated content? And is it all about the balance with the kind of um, authoritative content versus e-history that is less authoritative? Or, or do you just kind of caution against that kind of um, deep dive into raw material? Well, I think the... I think that it's hard to make a blanket statement about all this stuff. And even in the book, even though I have some concerns about e-history, I feel like the book is pretty balanced uh, in not being a, a total indictment and not mm -hmm. throwing the entire baby and the bathwater outside the window. Um, you know, I think the web has certainly empowered us in ways that were inconceivable, even when you and I were kids, right? Um, I mean, if there's a tornado coming, I don't wanna have to wait to be told that the tornado is on its way. I would like to be able to get that update sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, and uh, certainly the images that we're able to get from 
something like, you know, what happened with George Floyd in the summer of 2020 that was enabled by social media. And it awakened uh, a large percentage of this country towards injustices and mistreatment that perhaps was not fully understood and viscerally felt by enough people. And actually, I was just talking about this in the context of the civil rights movement, too, and photography and how important photography was to the civil rights movement because it enabled wide swaths of people around the country and around the world to see violence and injustice in ways that hadn't been captured before. And so social media and our information ecosystem that we currently operate in, I think it's too simplistic to say it's all good and it's all bad. I think it needs to be interrogated. Mm -hmm. And it's so complex and it's so big that that interrogation just takes a lot more time and effort than perhaps the current media system rewards and incentivizes. The system rewards and incentivizes quick opinions, hot takes, something's happening in Ukraine today, you wanna to go on the news an hour later and be able to say something smart about it because that is what the media and social media incentivize. And there can be some benefits to that. There can actually be some very good benefits for individuals who are able to manipulate that and use it to sell books or get on TV or get speaking gigs or what have you. We also need to make sure we're allowing for the longer, more complex, deep research into these things and that we are funding those and supporting those and that we are not seeing them as an afterthought. And because books like mine cannot be written in a day or a week or a month. And the best historical scholarship requires time and energy and resources in order to create. And I think we just need to constantly be advocating and reminding ourselves that we need to devote the energy and the resources to making that possible and not only devoted towards the bright, shiny objects in front of us that we see on social media. Mm -hmm. Totally. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so while I'm pulling up the first question here, uh, just uh, interestingly, I think another thing that's going on on social right now that is a really interesting example of information flowing around in a very intentional way is the MLB negotiations and the lockout. Uh, it's really wild. Like in my feed, and it's probably just because of my algorithm, like I am seeing all the player stuff and the, the the players association has like kicked butt with their messaging and gotten the fans totally behind the players and stuff and it's been really really interesting so there's this is all playing out in front of us with pretty much every topic that we interact with online on a daily basis but even then like i'm someone who i can i'm an information professional and i'm maybe scrutinizing the way that's happening with politics at a different level than i am every other topic that i'm looking at but it, it's at play and just and just to that point, like it's so important, right, to get out in front of the narrative and shape it the way you want. Mm -hmm. And so it's like they, you can tell that they've made a concerted effort to shape this as the fault of the owners. The players are in the right. We're just asking for our fair shake of this X amount of money, whatever it is. Right. And it's been a concerted media pitch, media blitz. ESPN has been involved. Social media has been involved you know, different, crowding out different players. And uh, it's all because that framing, if you can get it to stick initially, it becomes very powerful and becomes very hard to undo. Yeah, totally. Cool. So our first question is from Miss Vivian, who asks, what does the title of the book mean? Well, the title of the book is, the full title is History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. So the subtitle, I think, is pretty explanatory. Um, I argue in the book that social media and the world of web have very much changed how we think about the past, how we understand the past. I actually argue that it's actually changed the definition of history as well to the point earlier, making it user-centric, instantly gratifying, commercially viable, et cetera. The title, History Disrupted, I played around with the title a lot. At one point, I was actually gonna call the book e-history after the terminology that gets used in the book. But I felt that would be a little bit opaque and not sort of instantly grabbing people with a with an intro, like a hook, an interesting hook. And um, the more I thought about it, I more I thought about, okay, uh, what is all this really doing, right? 
is it changing history? So should it be history changed? Is it um, killing history? So should it should be like history dying or something, you know, played around with all these ideas. But I really felt like this notion of disrupting and disruptive, which is such a jargon in Silicon Valley, seemed appropriate for this context because not only have our understandings of history been disrupted and what we history we see in front of us been disrupted, but the profession of history itself has been disrupted uh, by the changes brought on by the social web. And so this title seemed to encapsulate all of those things, uh, both what we know and learn about history, as well as the discipline of history itself. And it sort of connected with this language that is used in Silicon Valley all the time about disruption. All right, we have a question from Mark, our favorite viewer from Hawaii. So hi. And uh, he's wondering, what inspired your fascination with history and the metaphor of history, how it gets recorded, by who, and what does and doesn't get recorded? And he asked this as a former history teacher. Well, hey, Mark. Uh, my wife and I went to the Hawaii State Society dinner in December here in D.C. So we're big fans of your state. Uh, so uh, I actually, my, my interest in history stems back to being a young kid. My, um, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and my mom was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany after the war. And so I've said this in several interviews that I've done, like, I don't remember a time where I wasn't interested in history. For me, history was just part of who I was. It was intimately linked with my identity. And I grew up sort of recognizing that I had this family history that was so much a part of who I was, and also that I had a responsibility to carry forth that legacy and to talk about that history, to understand it, and to grapple with it. And for me, actually, that is the word that I most associate with history, responsibility. To me, I see history as a responsibility, responsibility to get it as accurately as possible, and responsibility to communicate it as ethically and accurately as I can, and to share it and perpetuate it, both the knowledge and the lessons gleaned from its knowledge. And so that's what I've devoted my entire career to doing, whether it be in museums or libraries or government or this book. And it's also why I'm so interested in this topic, because I feel like, as I write in the book, when it comes to the web and social media, so much of the time, the accuracy of the information doesn't actually matter. It's more about these other factors, whether it be crowdsourcing or newsworthiness, or I have another chapter in there about virality. And that is what surfaces historical information to our attention. And to me, that has actually seems irresponsible. It seems in some ways to be the opposite of history. And so um, I've kind of now devoted this portion of my career to talking and writing about these issues and trying to instill historical and media literacy into citizens. Thank you. Cool. Um, one follow-up question to that before we get to uh, Mark's other question that's that's in the chat queue. Um, with the... I'm not formulating my question yet. I'll come back to it. I said, I apologize. Here, give you Mark. Mark's other one. Does the dem democratization of history through social media leave it open to deliberate distortion? And do you see that happening? I think you covered that a little bit, but if you could expand on that. Well, yeah, there's del there's deliberate distortion happening all the time on social media and the web. That's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, right? And so, how do we become more savvy information consumers? How do we become more aware of the agendas that are at work behind the scenes? And how do we learn to recognize why I'm seeing a certain piece of information about the past or any piece of information, to be honest, at a certain moment in time? And that's what I hope this book does. I do, again, this book is not a nostalgia for the good old days where only people like me could become historians, right? I, I do think that there's huge benefits to inviting more people into the conversation about history, diversifying the field of history, which has a huge diversity issue, getting more people from different backgrounds to be interested in history, to study history, to become professional historians. But these questions are all connected as far as I'm concerned, because if people don't feel like they 
can make a living being a historian, then they won't consider being a historian. And they can't make a living being a historian if we as a society and as an ecosystem are not funding and supporting expert-centric, always evolving, intrinsically valuable scholarship. And so if the web is shifting our definition of history right before our eyes and devaluing the role of expert-centric knowledge that is always evolving and centers on its intrinsic value and which doesn't deliver instantly gratifying answers, then that, that makes it very hard for people to become professional historians and make a living as professional historians. And that makes it hard to diversify the profession because no one thinks that they can actually make a living doing this. So it's all connected. And this is one of the arguments that I make in the book about why history is being disrupted by the web. One of the things that you touch on, and I, I, the question came together for, for me here. Um, one of the things you touch on towards the end is the how we have to be aware of the fact that there is content specifically from the journalism space that becomes elevated as history, such as 1619 Project and other works like that, where um, it, it is important and it has a place and it's valuable, but the, the creators aren't necessarily coming from the point of the authoritative traditional history um, processes and peer review and that kind of thing. Um, and considering the information landscape now where we have a wide range of books around um, the history of race in this country and anti-racism and such, um, how how would you recommend that we can look at those different texts and, and, and um, take for them the value that they bring, but also understand that there's different types of content being put forward for us to, to digest? Yeah, so in the chapter in the book on the newsworthy past, I talk about how journalists have increasingly moved into the history space. And this follows a trend in just the way journalism is, is done, right? So now, for example, there's just a constant need for content. Talk about that content churn, right? My, my sister, who's a journalist at one point, was being asked to put up four stories per day for the site that she worked for. So, well, history offers a wide range of stories. So it's a great place to find content and to build content. And there are entire history sections now. Time Magazine has one. The Washington Post has one. The New York Times has had all these various history sections that it's put together um, because it's great content. It connects to issues that readers care about. It connects to things in the news. And in the case of history, oftentimes the scholarship has already been done by a professional historian. So a journalist just needs to repurpose it or repackage it for consumption on the web or in their publication, and they can sort of push it out as part of the content churn. So uh, I, I argue in the book that just all this content needs to be evaluated within that context, right? And uh, there are some journalists who do really excellent work that is historical in nature, and there are others who do less excellent work that is historical in nature. And there is some content that's produced about history by media publications and media companies that um, doesn't go deep. And there is some that does go deep. So uh, it's unfortunately, it just puts burden on us as information consumers to just be a little bit more critical and skeptical of these packages when they come out and understand why they're being produced, by whom, what scholarship they're drawing from, or if they're not drawing on scholarship, why are they not drawing on the scholarship? What are they leaving out? Uh, what are they um, simplifying? And then it's incumbent upon us to, well, it becomes on us to see if we want to go dig deeper and learn more or not. In the case of the 1619 Project, for you know, one thing that's really interesting about that, so the original issue that came out in August of 2019, it had some really excellent essays in it, including one, um, oh gosh, his name just blanked, um, sociologist, Matthew Desmond, sociologist at Harvard, wrote a fantastic essay in that magazine about um, sort of slavery and plantations and how the legacies of those are reflected in our current day capitalism. It's a brilliant essay. But what I realized when I talked to people is that pretty much no one had read it. <laughs> you, know, you know, everyone was really fixated on the sort of political battle around 1619. And 
the way 1619 became this political football that got kicked back and forth between progressive media and conservative media and, and then this counter project by Trump, which was sort of silly, the 1776 commission, which never really went anywhere, right? And most people never actually took the time to read the whole magazine. And there were some really excellent essays in that magazine written by some really brilliant experts and scholars who have thought deeply and crit about, critically about these issues for years. So, um, you know, the picture is nuanced, right? These projects can have a lot of value and they can have some really good stuff in there. Uh, but, you know, they can also get woven into these larger political and cultural fights. And then it becomes much more about the symbolism about the project than the actual project itself. And it becomes a distraction from the real quality work that's in them. Awesome. Thank you for uh, responding to that. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to toss it over to Kyla in case you have any closing uh, questions or thoughts. And uh, other than that, we're going to have to wrap it up, which is sad because this has been a really stimulating conversation. I think, um, you know, it would be really interesting to, to have conversations with you about this topic after different periods of time to see how our lives are evolving. Because in the span, you know, your book really covers my coming of age and, and becoming a professional and such. And it's kind of mind boggling to think of how much things have changed just since the mid nineties and, and even just since 2016 and 20, 2008 since then. So uh, really fascinating stuff. Yeah, this has been amazing. I actually have a, about 50 more questions, but I think in the interest of time, what I will just say um, just really quickly is how much uh, on a personal level uh, I valued reading this is it really had me thinking about my own as I said before, my own consumption, my own thinking, my own critical thinking. And, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking as we were talking tonight is for those people who are not, who didn't do their undergraduate degree in history or don't necessarily wouldn't consider themselves interested in history. I think one of the things that's so important, and I'd love Jason for you to speak on this too, is like, why is history important? And I mean, us historians say that it informs our present and it is how we make decisions about what's going on around us. And so being able to, consume history uh, shapes, I think, everything that we do. And I, J Jason, can you offer a little bit on that before we close out? Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. And thank you for your kind words about the book. If I could be so bold, I would love it if you'd be willing to write a review of the book, either on Amazon or on Goodreads. Again, algorithms, right? Algorithms, they surface material based on these signals of attention, whether they be ratings or reviews, and they signal it to people that they know are like you because they've collected all your data. So the ecosystem that we're in, the, the reviews on sites like Amazon and Goodreads do actually help surface the book to more people. And if you're interested in more of this stuff, because like I said, I had a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the book, please do sign up for my newsletter because uh, throughout the newsletter, I have been uh, sharing things from the book as well as other insights as events uh, evolve, including stuff about Ukraine. Um, in terms of that question, you know, I grappled with this throughout writing the book because invariably any book about history has to make the argument for why history should exist in the first place, right? And this is true of all history communication. If you really boil it down, any history communication on the web, any piece of e-history on the web is essentially making an argument for the discipline of history. Even if it's not doing so explicitly, it's doing so implicitly. And so this is one of the challenges, right? Because if you look back at how people thought about history in the past and how people wrote about history in the past, history was assumed to be important because it had intrinsic value. It was just important to know about history just for the sake of knowing about history. But in our current moment, history is being forced to prove its extrinsic value. So why is history valuable? It's valuable because it helps us do other things, right? History can be valuable to social justice and fighting for human rights. History can be valuable to the news media and understanding the news cycle. History can be valuable to critical thinking and media, critical thinking skills or media literacy and media literacy skills. So it no longer holds up in this current ecosystem to just argue that knowing history is a good in of itself. History now must be tied to these other extrinsic measures of value. Otherwise, it gets relegated to the bottom of the news feed or to the back of the course catalog. I would say that 
in this world that we are living in right now, there is no way that you can understand anything that is happening unless you have some sort of grounding in historical knowledge and historical understanding. And I would also posit that you are unlikely to get that necessary grounding just from consuming history online. And if you read my book, you will understand better why. So the closing argument would be, if I may judge jury, I would say that uh, not only is history valuable to understanding the world around you, but the professional practice of history is essential to even having a foundation and a basis for that understanding. And the historical knowledge cycle that takes time to produce and that is time consuming and, and is, is costly, is expensive, is worth the investment. And we should not sacrifice that because we have all of this e-history available at our fingertips. And uh, to put a little cliffhanger for someday, we'll have you back, Jason. Knowing that history from a really solid um, understanding of professional history and world events and how things happen over time, how do we not exist in a state of sheer terror <laughs> in moments like this? Because there are patterns in history and you know, we, we act so much like things just happen in a vacuum within one generation and human nature is a thing that's been a thing for a long time and the, the elements are different, but um, you know, we might have a chance at avoiding some gargantuan mistakes if we have a deeper understanding of, of history from a, a primary source basis and also professional history basis. So anywho, that's my little editorial comment to, to hold us over till the next time. Um, really grateful to Jason Steinhauer uh, for his work and for bringing attention to this topic and bringing us together tonight. Thank you to everyone who shared comments. Thank you to the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights for co-presenting and Kyla Hannington, the Public Outreach and Engagement Division Manager, uh, who we very much appreciate. Uh, before we go, I just want to give a shout out for an event that we have coming up on March 15th. And it's a very exciting event for us because it is our first official indoor in-person program for the library in two years. <laughs> so we're super excited for that. We are hosting a uh, pilot and author, Carol Hobson, who wrote a historical novel uh, based on the life of pioneer aviatrix Bessie Coleman, and it's called A Pair of Wings. Uh, Carol was just featured in Ebony Magazine. She had a big corporate career and, and decided she wanted to become a pilot. And she is dedicating her life's work to uh, inspiring African-American women to enter the field of aviation to help, um, you know, do great things there because there's been a lot of history of uh, African-Americans, both men and women uh, advancing aviation history, and they have not always gotten the credit that they deserve, um, case in point with the Tuskegee Airmen. So join us on Tuesday, March 15th at 6.30 p.m. at the South Bowie Branch. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat before we go. Uh, aside from that, thank you, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Kyla. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Stay safe. Get a booster if you haven't yet. Get another one if you already got one, <laughs> if it's loud. And, uh, we'll again soon. Thanks, everyone.